can't tell you about lecture. Some of them do it in my class. Yeah, they, they usually dress up. But, you know, they're supposed to be simulating like a report. I mean, for a long time, they didn't dress up. But somehow, they've got them to start. Yeah. Yeah. We got a lawyer side. And the judge has to do something about it. Come back to court and flip flops. Yeah. I don't think so. Hey, I'm telling you, man. Mm-hmm. We got some uh, we got some lawyers that are awful. Uh, <laughs> I hope these kids aren't on the show. We're just going to draw them. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to go live on the web here in a couple of seconds. And I'll give you a few of them when we go. Okay? Except I'm not first. I'll wait. Okay. So, so I. Uh, so you're ready. Yeah. So I. So I don't do something really stupid. Uh, Could I ask everyone to come in and please be seated so we can get started? Can everyone hear me? Okay. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Allen Hines, and on behalf of West Virginia University College of Law and the Republican Law Caucus, I would like to thank everyone for coming this evening. I am excited to be able to help bring such a unique and valuable event to the College of Law and to the community. It's not every day that we get the opportunity to vote for Supreme Court justices. Our justices play a vital role in interpreting our state laws, not only affecting lawyers and law students, but also all of the citizens in our state. It is easy as a law student to get caught up in books and old cases and forget that one day we may be presenting our own cases before these very people. Therefore, I cannot stress enough the importance of getting to know the candidates to both law students and community members. It is also wonderful to be able to host events like this that bring not only the candidates, but voters and also practicing attorneys and students in the community together. I would like to thank the candidates, Menace Ketchum, Beth Walker, and Margaret Workman for their participation and willingness to address the community. I would also like to thank Dean McConnell and the entire law school administration for their wonderful help and <clears throat> support in putting together this important event. And finally, I would like to thank the businesses, people, and organizations that helped make this event possible. The law offices of Goodwin and Ware, Hugert Law Offices, Zach and Eunice Flores, Mike Walker, the Montegalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia um, College of Law Student Bar Association. I would also like to take this time to thank the Democratic organizations for their wonderful support and cooperation in helping make this event possible. It is not often that our political groups get a chance to work together. And finally, I would like to thank Chris Walters of the College Republicans for dreaming up this event and all of his hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Josh Gerald. Um, I'm a third year law student here at the College of Law. And I would just like to echo everything that Stephanie said. Thank you, candidates. Thank you, Judge Stone, and all the organizations involved that made this possible. Um, I'm honored to be here um, in front of so many members of our community. Um, I think as future members of the bar, and as students of the law, that it's really important um, that we remain engaged in our profession, um, that we remain curious about the roles we'll serve in the future, and that we appreciate the importance of public service. And um, everybody on our panel does that. Um, and in that way, I think it makes perfect sense that the College of Law is hosting this function because it shares such a significant relationship to the court. Um, Two of our three candidates here are graduates of our law school, and three of the five candidate, uh, members of the bench right now um, are graduates of the College of Law. So um, we are privileged to be here. Um, our organization, the Democratic Law Caucus, um, is very happy to be playing a small part, um, but we think it's a significant part in bringing the candidates closer to the community and. Um, moving forward. So I hope this function is informative and worthwhile for everybody. Um, I'll keep it short and I will bring Eric Hayhurst up to introduce our distinguished moderator, Judge Robert Stone. Thank you. Uh, as Josh said, my name is Eric Hayhurst. I'm a third year law student here at the College of Law and member of the Democratic Law Caucus. Before I introduce our esteemed moder moderator, I'd like to go over the format for you this evening and the rules of the event. Um, <clears throat> the candidates will begin with a five-minute opening statement, or up to five minutes. Uh, the, we'll then go into a uh, question and answer session uh, that includes three predetermined questions that the candidates received uh, last week that they pre prepared remarks to, and they will uh, receive three minutes of time to answer e each of those questions. Uh, we're then going to take a short pause um, to uh, gather questions that the you, the members of the audience, have written. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to write one uh, before the event started, uh, the ushers in the back have some cards uh, and pens. If you think of a question during the first 20 minutes or so, the first part, uh, just wave to them. They'll get you a card, and we'll put it in the mix. Uh, then the second part of the debate will uh, consist of five or six questions uh, from you, the audience members, uh, and then um, depending on uh, how, how many we get through in about 30 minutes' time. Uh, and then each candidate will have five minutes for a closing statement. Um, 
With that, I'd like to remind everyone that tonight's event is being streamed live on the web. Uh, for that reason, we ask that you please turn off all of your cell phones, and uh, particularly your Wi-Fi devices, including Blackberries, Trios, um, iPhones, because the Wi-Fi will interfere with the audio system. We don't want that going out on the web uh, or here in the, the courtroom. Um, also, if you could please remain in your seats during the event, uh, so there's not a lot of commotion in, in the auditor or in the courtroom, especially during that two-minute pause that we take uh, to get the questions ready from you all. Uh, also, please uh, no applause or outbursts, except in two instances uh, where the candidates will be introduced and at the conclusion of the forum. Uh, also, we'd like to remind everyone that there's going to be a reception this evening after the forum in the uh, lobby uh, where we'll have hors d'oeuvres and refreshments. Please help yourselves and uh, um, chat with the candidates if, you, uh, if they stick around. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening. We're very honored to have a very well-respected member of the bench and bar with us this evening uh, <clears throat> to moderate. Uh, judge Robert Stone is a circuit court judge for the 17th Judicial Circuit for Montegelli County. He's held office for 23 years, and uh, he will be retiring at the end of this term. Uh, Judge Stone graduated from the College of Law, where he was a member of the Order of the Coif and the associate editor of the Law Review. Uh, Judge Stone served as clerk for Judge Maxwell of the Northern District uh, of West Virginia, and he's a past president of the Judicial Association and an adjunct lecturer in trial advocacy at the College of Law. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Judge Robert B. Stone. Thank you very much, Eric, for that kind <clears throat> introduction. I'm pleased to be here, honored to be asked to serve as a moderator. We have three very distinguished candidates for our highest court position, our Supreme Court. Uh, the only thing I would add, because this is not about me and I'm not speaking, I'm not telling jokes, which will surprise a lot of people that are here, I know, but um, I, there's one other thing I wanted to explain. The order that, that we proceed at the various times have been determined by drawing lots, believe it or not, right over here in the corners to who's going to go first, second, and third in each part of uh, our program this evening. So the first part of the program, our, um, the first part of the program is an opportunity for our candidates to make opening statements. Um, <clears throat> our first um, speaker to make an opening statement is Margaret Workman. Margaret Workman is a former Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, sitting from 1988 until the year 2000. Justice Workman is a graduate of West Virginia University in 1969 and W. College of Law in 1974. Justice Workman. Good evening. It's great to be here uh, with Judge Stone the dean and other members of the law school community and the uh, community at large, and I appreciate all of you who helped put this uh, forum together. I'd like to use my opening statement just to tell you a little bit about my background, my experience, and why I'm running for the Supreme Court and why I hope to have one of uh, the majority of West Virginians two votes. I uh, am a native West Virginian. My father was a Boone County coal miner who later became a Charleston city firefighter, so I grew up in a working family. I worked my way through college and law school here at WVU. And um, my proudest achievement is I'm the mother of three great young adults who are in, one just graduated from college and, and uh, two are still in college. And I keep saying on the campaign trail that uh, one of the things that I have to offer that neither of the other two candidates have to offer is that you won't have to guess about what kind of a justice I'll be. I have a long, extensive record. I was a circuit court judge for seven years prior to becoming a Supreme Court justice. And, and by the way, uh, if elected, I will be the only Supreme Court justice with any circuit court experience. And I think that's very important to have because the reality is, as Judge Stone can tell you, and those practicing trial lawyers of the trial process is something that's very good to know on the appeal level. When I served as a circuit court judge, I uh, inherited, I was the youngest judge in West Virginia. I inherited the largest backlog of cases in the entire state. 
By the time I left, I reduced it to the smallest in the circuit and also the, uh, held more jury trials than any judge in West Virginia during that period of time. I was fortunate to be the first woman ever elected to any statewide office in West Virginia. And during my service on the Supreme Court, you know, I think there are basic qualities that people have a right to expect, and I believe that I delivered those qualities as a justice. One is fairness. That's obvious. And by that, I mean that you, a judge must make their rulings according to the law and no other consideration. Uh, I um, am very proud of all the awards I've received, like the, I've received awards from this law school and from uh, an outstanding WVU alumni. Uh, as a, uh, the Florence Crittenden Society awarded me their statewide honor for being a child advocate. The Prosecuting Attorneys Association of West Virginia gave me uh, an award for the work that I did in protecting child victims of crime. But you know, one award, two awards I've never received I'm kind of proud of is I never received the Defense Counsel or the Trial Lawyers Award. And probably that's because I was straight down the middle, very neutral. I find that when you are a judge and you have experience as I do and you are that kind of judge, very independent, it's a lot harder to raise money. Boy, the money goes to the people who the organizations and the interests think are going to be on their side most of the time. And I can tell you that my record as Margaret Workman is never on anybody's side except the side of the law. I took a special interest during my time there in um, family courts, helped develop one of the strongest bodies of law in the United States to help protect abused and neglected children. Um, I believe that judges should work to improve the law. I'm the just, just chief justice that started the administrative initiatives to improve our court system through the Gender Fairness Task Force, the Broadwater Committee on Children's Issues, um, a number of other committees that I started, the future of the judiciary system, uh, chaired by former President Hardesty, who's with us this evening. All of those things were started by me in my capacity as Chief Justice. As a sitting judge, I also visited every single prison and secure juvenile facility in West Virginia, even the old Moundsville. And what the warden said, I was one, I think, the second judge who'd ever stepped a foot in there. I visited most domestic violence shelters in West Virginia because I learned so much from talking to the people who were the victims in those shelters, more than I learned usually at the conferences or reading the books by the experts. The reason that I'm running for the Supreme Court again, I left and did not run in 2000. I chose not to run because I had three children who were entering their adolescent years. They were little stair-step kids, and I thought it was time for me to make them my priority. So I spent a year uh, just reconnecting with them, making sure they were on the right track. And after spending a year at home, I opened a small practice of law that I've done the last uh, seven or eight years. I believe that I can help, number one, calm the turmoil that we've been seeing at the state Supreme Court. Everyone, I think of every philosophical persuasion, is concerned about the integrity issues that have arisen, about the fact that so many people, and especially I hear this from lawyers, go in that court and they feel that the votes are already decided before they even make their arguments. I can tell you that when I'm on the Supreme Court, I'm going to work because I have the experience and the maturity and the relationships with the, both the present justices and, and these individuals. I know how to communicate effectively with people, and that's a key ingredient to be an effective Supreme Court justice. I want to calm the turmoil. I want to help restore the faith of the people in West Virginia in the Supreme Court and be sure that that court resumes the position that it once held in the eyes of the people of West Virginia. And I would appreciate your consideration when the time comes. Thank you. <laughs> Menace Ketchum is a senior partner at Green Ketchum in Huntington, West Virginia. Mr. Ketchum graduated from Ohio University in 1964 and uh, from the West Virginia University College of Law in 1967, where he served as associate editor of the West Virginia Law Review. Mr. Ketchum. Mike, Mike. Uh, is this working? Can you hear me back here? Back here? All right. I'm at, oh, there you go. All right. I didn't think it was working. Uh, I am in a sketch. I got to get a couple of things, uh, out of the ray, way real quick. Uh, President Hardesty reminded me about my judicial philosophy coming in, so I have to get my judicial philosophy out of the way, and it's simply this. I'd rather make it up than look it up. Nah, that's a joke, law students. <laughs> and secondly, Margaret, you know, talked about she had, she had made a, a trip to the penitentiary at Moundsville. Uh, 
I want you to know that, that I'm the only candidate that has spent a year in the penitentiary at Moundsville. So without that, I want to make my opening statement. True, it's true. I, I served a year there. Uh, the first thing I want to do is tell you who I am. And later I'll tell you why I'm running. And you'll see during the questions and answers that I have some really strong views on the law and our court. So I just want to tell you really who I am starting out. I'm from Wayne County, and I'm a trial lawyer. And as I go around the state, I've been battered with it, not by my opponents, Margaret and Beth, but by third parties saying, you're a plaintiff's lawyer. You must be bad. Well, I'm here, and the facts are that that's not correct, that I've been mislabeled. I'm from Huntington, and it's not a very big town. And in my career of 41 years, I have tried 174 cases to jury verdict. Now, for you law students, you think that you do that in two or three years. There's not three or four lawyers in this state that have tried 174 trials to jury verdict. Most lawyers, trial lawyers in Charleston, try two or three in their career. The point is, during those 174 uh, trials, 51% of them were for the defense, and 49% of them were the plaintiff. I had a, my experience is really kind of level. I represented Allstate, I represented State Farm, I represented Zurich American. I was regional counsel for these firms, but I do do plaintiff's work. But I was trying to, I think I've been mislabeled a little bit by third parties. My Supreme Court experience has been the same. I have 35 reported cases out of the West Virginia Supreme Court. Most of you say, gee, that's not many. Most lawyers never go in the Supreme Court. There's only a handful of lawyers, like my trials, like my jury verdicts, only a handful of lawyers that have 35 reported cases out of the West Virginia Supreme Court. The point is this. They're evenly balanced. A third were for business. Some others were for the defense. And more than half were for the plaintiff. They were tax cases you, for, for business, you name it. I'm a litigator, I'm a trial lawyer, and I'm proud of it, although I'm hammered in the press for it. Now, that's a little bit who I am. Now, here's what I've been doing lately. When you are a litigator, and, and I'll get into this later, we are raising a generation of mediation lawyers. Nobody goes to court anymore. But when you're a litigator, you burn out if you actually try cases. And so for the last eight years, I went into public service. Uh, Governor Manchin appointed me to the Mine Safety Emergency Mine Safety Task Force after SAGO to come up with new safety rules for the mines. Everybody said, oh, it won't work, because on this safety board, there's three union miners and there's three company representatives. It won't work. What they failed to say is that Governor Manchin appointed a facilitator, a tie-breaking vote, and it was me. And after eight months, we came out of there with unanimous recommendations on every new safety rule to be implemented by the legislature. Another thing I did on public service, I was appointed by the Supreme Court of Appeals to the Judicial Hearing Board. How many of you law students know what the Judicial Hearing Board is? The Judicial Hearing Board disciplines judges. The Judicial Hearing Board hears the ethics complaints against judges, makes findings of facts, and makes recommendations to the Supreme Court of Appeals for the punishment. And finally, and you won't like it in Morgantown for, for six years, I just had to resign to run for this. I've been on the Board of Governors at March. Uh, hey, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not even a graduate of Marshall. They say, why get on that board? Well, I'll tell you, what would happen to Morgantown if they took West Virginia University out of here? Morgantown would go away. I'm from Huntington. If they took Marshall out of Huntington, Huntington would go away. That's why I did it. And for the last four and a half years, I've been chairman and vice chairman, and we've worked wonderfully with West Virginia University. 
So I look forward to telling you my views on the law and tell you why I'm running in the end. And you guys don't be so serious when I say, when somebody tells you a judge wants to make it up rather than look it up. Thank you. Our third candidate is Beth Walker. She is a partner at Bowles Rice in Charleston, West Virginia. Ms. Walker graduated from Hillsdale College in 1987 and the Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University in 1990, where she served as the articles editor on The Ohio State Law Journal. Uh, Ms. Walker. Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure uh, to be here at the law school tonight, and thanks to all of you, particularly those in the front row here, who did so much work to put this together. I know it was a challenge given uh, our schedules and trying to get this in before, on, before Tuesday. We're, I guess, five days out now. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for giving us the opportunity to be here. I want to talk a little bit about the race and a little bit about who I am and my judicial philosophy. First of all, voters in West Virginia are making an extraordinarily important decision this year. We are electing two justices uh, at one time. That doesn't happen very much. So we're electing 40% of our Supreme Court, the sole appellate court in our state, and these justices will serve for 12-year terms, meaning, of course, that we're making a decision about the future of West Virginia from now until January of 2021. It's a long time. So since we're at the law school, I'll frame it this way. The issue before the voters is, will we permit politics to continue to overshadow the rule of law in our court system. Who am I? Um, I'm an experienced lawyer. Uh, I've been practicing at Bowles Rice for 20 years. I've handled cases in more than 30 counties around the state. So I feel like, although I'm based in Charleston, that I have a pretty good sense of our state's court system. I've been a leader in my firm. I've had the good fortune of working with some amazing lawyers who are great mentors and have given me the opportunity to do things like be on our firm's executive committee. Uh, I didn't go to the West Virginia uh, College of Law, but I have hired a lot of West Virginia College of Law graduates as a recruiting partner, so I hope I get some credit there. And I've also been a leader in my community. You know, I, I believe that you need to give something back, and I hope all of you will keep this in mind, all of you law students in particular, uh, once you graduate, you know, you get all tied up with uh, getting involved in cases, earning a living, paying back your student loans. Uh, but there's a real responsibility, and I think the bar in particular has that responsibility, to give something back. So I've been real involved in the community and organizations like Leadership West Virginia, uh, which gives folks an opportunity to get more involved in our state. The Girl Scouts, uh, an organization near and dear to my heart, and also Canal Pastoral Counseling Center, where I was a president of that board of directors. But I got to thinking about our court system, and I got to thinking about the perception I referred to in a minute ago, the perception that politics maybe plays more in, in the decisions of the Supreme Court than the rule of law does. And so I thought, well, somebody needs to get involved, and I can sit back and express my concerns about our court system and wish that these awful perceptions would go away, or I could try to do something about it. And that's why I'm standing here, never having run for office, um, I'm not sure now that I recommend a statewide office for your first political office, <laughs> um, 45,000 miles later. But I'm here because, very simply, I think cases ought to be decided fairly and impartially and based on the law and not based on who the parties are. Margaret referred to her. There is a perception sometimes that cases are decided before you walk in the courtroom, before the arguments are heard and before the briefs are submitted. It's, I also think it's really important to remember the separation of powers in our government. You know, we have, a, we have three branches, and the, and the judicial branch is there to be the judicial branch and not to legislate from the bench, not to leave those very important policy decisions on whatever issue is facing our state for the elected senators and members of the House of Delegates. And, and not to advance as a justice a political or social agenda. You know, it'll be very important for me as a justice to leave my personal opinions about policy issues aside and to just look carefully at each case, look carefully at the law, and make a fair and impartial and unbiased decision. 
In my view, the Constitution is not a living and breathing document that is subject to be revised according to the whims of society. It is a Constitution, and it is the rule of law. And finally, I think it's important that justices maintain some dignity and have respect for not only the lawyers of who appear before them, but also for uh, the parties who are in cases. You know, there have been some outrageous statements made over the years uh, by justices addressing lawyers who appear before the court. I think that has to stop. And so I appreciate your attention. I look forward to uh, having a discussion of not only the predetermined questions, but also I encourage questions from the audience. Sometimes we don't get a lot, but I think this group might be able to come up with some. Uh, thank you again, and I too ask for one of your votes. All right, we are ready to proceed to our questions. We have three, uh, they're labeled predetermined questions. They're questions that were written in advance and provided to our uh, candidates. And uh, again, uh, lots were drawn for the order of proceeding uh, to answer these predetermined questions. And so we will proceed with these questions. Our first question uh, is posed uh, first to uh, Mr. Ketchum, let me say that each candidate is afforded three minutes to respond to this question, um, and um, they will go in the order I think this would be uh, Mr. Ketchum, Ms. Walker, and Justice Workman would be the order that uh, we would proceed in. And the question is this. It's first posed to uh, Mr. Ketchum. In an article written last month, the Charleston Gazette highlighted the recent decline in the number of appeals the court has been hearing. The article cited that in 2006, the court heard 11% of the appeals brought to it and only 17% last year. This was compared to 41% heard in 1999 and 52% in 2000. The article also noted that the court at the end of the year will have been, quote, in vacation, unquote, for three months and 22 days. The question to each of you is, do you see this as a problem? Why or why not? And if so, how do you propose to make the court more efficient if elected? Uh, it is a problem. Uh, our Supreme Court of Appeals is not working hard to hear our citizens' appeals. And statistics bear that out. In 19... 99, the justices in our court wrote on average, each of them wrote 59 written opinions a year. That is includes per curiam opinions. So in 1999, each justice averaged writing 59 opinions a year. In 2005, that dropped to each justice writing 29 opinions a year. It dropped. 30 opinions a year from 1999 to 2005 to 29. And in 2006, it dropped to 19 opinions on average by the justices of our Supreme Court, written opinions per year. Something's wrong if you have 59 on average in 99 and it drops to 19 in 2006. Well, you might say, well, there might be less appeals. Actually, there was 3,539 applications for appeals in 1999. There was five more applications for appeal in 2006, 3,544. Our court is just not working. In 1999, our court granted for full hearing and written opinion 41% of the applications presented to it for appeal. In 2006, they granted 11%. And this year, it'll probably be nine. There is a problem. They're not working. We get into the dispute. Yes, they'll be in vacation for three months and 22 days this year. What's that? Oh, one minute. Okay. They'll be in three months and 22 days. Uh, I'm sorry. Three, three months and 22 days in vacation this year. But I check. Other justices have been given speeches on it. I have the speeches in my car by other justices. During this three months and 22 days, there won't be a justice there. 
There won't be a law clerk there. Some of the law clerk took, clerks took second jobs, and there won't be a court secretary there, a judge's secretary there. If you want to talk to the judge, you have to call the court clerk's office, Roy Perry, and leave a message. I'm upset about it. This court ought to take, for what they're paying, two to three weeks vacations a year, like they did under Margaret's court when she was with the Miller court, and take two or three weeks vacation a year, grant 41% of these petitions for appeal, and get back to work. It may not seem a... It's time, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike, I think that the Supreme Court has a lot of challenges. It is the busiest court of its kind in the country. Keep in mind, there are only 12 states that don't have intermediate courts of appeals, and the sheer numbers... Uh, that we're talking about, and Menes had mentioned those, um, dwarf the other courts. Our court has a lot of work to do. And there were almost 4,000 petitions for appeal filed in 2007, and 73% of those were workers' comp cases. It's a huge workload. Now, what I, I fear this criticism has ignored is a couple of important things. First of all, um, our court has a huge administrative role, a growing, an administrative role that has grown considerably since 1999, given the addition of the family court system and a number of other additions on the criminal side. So it has to have some time, as pointed out recently by Justice Davis in an op-ed piece, uh, it has to have some time not just to be the administrators of our entire court system, and those five justices are ultimately responsible for the administration of our court system, but also to read and consider carefully each and every one of those in 2007, 4,000 appeals. That takes time. And I think that the words in vacation, which is a technical term for the court actually not holding hearings on those days, um, are a little misleading, and it is not that Supreme Court justices are sitting on the beach somewhere taking a vacation. It is literally, the court has a, having just as many active days of hearings now as it's had over the last decade. It just has a tremendous challenge. That being said, lawyers around the state are frustrated that the court's not taking more cases. I hear it all, all in all 55 counties as I travel around. So what do we need to do about it? I think we need to determine whether this large workload of workers' comp cases is going to continue. And if it does, is the Supreme Court the best way to handle those appeals? Would, the, it, would it be advisable for the legislature to come up with an alternative to our current system? Maybe that would give those claimants in the workers' comp cases and a better review, a more qualified review. I'm, I'm not afraid to say that I am not a physician, and I'm probably not the best person to determine whether someone receives a 15% or a 40% permanent partial disability award. Uh, so maybe that is something, if, this can, if these workers' comp cases continue to increase, maybe there is a better way to do it. But finally, I want, uh, I want to step back and say that I'm a little hesitant to focus on these numbers because I am much more concerned about the quality of work that the Supreme Court does than in the little num literal number of percentage of cases or numbers of appeals. I think we need to focus on having justices who are doing a great job in addition to working hard. Thank you. Justice Wortman. Well, I agree that it is a problem that the court has been accepting for full review uh, a dwindling number of cases over the years. As Minnis pointed out, um, I served on the Miller Court, and that court processed more cases than at any time in the history of West Virginia. We worked very hard. The reason that it's extremely important that the Supreme Court accept and hear a lot of cases is that, as was pointed out, we're one of only a handful of states that does not have an intermediate appeal court. Now, the issue has arisen during the campaign, should we have an intermediate appeal court? It would be a nice thing to have, but, uh, you know, I know a lot about the court system, having been there, and like when you run your household, you've got to establish your priorities. And I don't think the establishment of an intermediate appeal court is our highest priority. The two things that I would like to recommend, first of all, since the 90s, I've been calling for some kind of reform on the appeal process for workers' compensation cases. The quality of the review is abysmal, and that's not a criticism of the court members, past or present. I'm not saying you're lazy or that they're slackers. You cannot handle that many cases in a proper manner and give the quality of review that it deserves, not only because there's so little specialized knowledge in the medical area on the Supreme Court, but because there are so many of those cases, I think there were close to 4,000 of those here recently. 
And even though the court's not accepting many of them for four views, they still have to process them on the, on the motion docket. The second thing that we need as far as our priorities in the Supreme Court system is to bolster up the family court system. I helped establish that system, lobbied the legislature's chief justice to start it, and it's been an improvement. But unfortunately, that is the court system that most West Virginians interface with. And we need better facilities, we need better resources, we need so that people who are going through divorces and other domestic situations don't have to wait for months to be heard at a crucial time in their lives. So those are, those are my ideas of the priorities. And, you know, I want to say one thing that's a little bit uh, related but somewhat off the subject, and that is when I served on the Supreme Court, I actually served with 13 other justices. Uh, there were Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, and we argued heatedly about the issues. But we, it was never personal, and we decided those cases according to the law. And I think that one of the reasons that, um, that I am concerned about the dwindling number of cases is that it's important that the judges take a lot of cases and that they dispose of them in a, in a manner that comports with the law of West Virginia and in a manner that uh, makes our court system more efficient. All right. Thank you. Our um, second question um, will be addressed first to um, Ms. Walker and then followed by Justice Workman and Mr. Ketchum. If elected, you will serve for 12 years until the year 2021. What do you foresee as the most pressing issue facing our Supreme Court, and how can you help address that problem? The most pressing issue I feel faces our Supreme Court and our entire court system is, is what I referred to in my opening statement, and that is this lingering perception uh, feeling by folks both inside and outside of West Virginia that our court system isn't fair, that our court system is unlike other places and isn't a place where folks want to uh, come to West Virginia and create jobs, stay in West Virginia, invest in West Virginia. You know, like, like all of us, I want uh, our kids and grandkids to have the opportunity to stay in West Virginia if they choose once they finish school or whatever, kind, whatever they do. And right now, um, we're not moving forward as a state. And in part, you know, regardless, there are a number of sources, but one of the key issues that folks believe need to be addressed is our court system. And what I will do about it, there's a, at least two specific things that I can think of. One is our Supreme Court has, over the years, been increasingly hesitant to uphold circuit judges uh, dismissing cases properly, summary judgment, whatever uh, the, uh, the procedural way that it gets there. And you know, I think that that's something that when there is a case that is not of merit, it needs to be dismissed. Um, and so that's priority number one. Priority number two is to do something about the way cases languish in our courts, unfortunately. I have a case right now that has been pending since 1991. Uh, it kind of, that particular county, which will remain unnamed, doesn't follow the statutory rule practice of dismissing a case if it's been inactive for a year, that county just thumbs its nose at that rule. I don't think that's right. Another case I had sat for seven years worth of about every nine months or so, a, a continuance of the trial, primarily by the circuit judge. And finally, in, in, a, in a summary fashion, after seven years, the judge denied all of my client's pretrial motion, granted the other, all of the other side's pretrial motion, and forced my client to go into a settlement mode, although he desperately just wanted to have a jury trial in that case. Those are the kinds of, those are not just the rulings that the Supreme Court makes, but those experiences in court are the kinds of things that I've sat down with my clients and they said, I'm never coming to West Virginia again. Um, I'm never going to do business here again. And I think that's a problem. And that's not to say that Supreme Court justices should favor business or labor or one side or the other, but we need to even the playing field. We need to give folks due process and we need to improve the reputation of our court system. Thank you, Justice Workman. Well, I, I think that there are several very pressing problems. The most immediate problem is that there is a crisis of confidence in the Supreme Court because of the so-called integrity issues that have been uh, brought up over the last couple of years. And I think it's vital that we begin the work to restore the confidence of the people in the Supreme Court, and especially for the litigants and the lawyers who go there to feel and to know that their cases are being decided according to the law and other consideration. I think the second crisis is this whole election process 
uh, financing of judicial elections, it's getting worse. Uh, you have to either, uh, in my opinion, be the uh, you know philosophical darling of one interest group or the other, or you've got to be very wealthy. And I don't mean just a little bit wealthy. You better be very wealthy as you get ready to try to run for a statewide campaign. And tied in with that election issue, and I, and I think it's probably the issue that concerns me most about the court system in West Virginia, is that when you go out and you speak with these groups, and I'm talking about all sides of the philosophical aisle, they all say that they just want fair judges. And having been involved in prior judicial races, some of this problem has always existed, but it's getting worse. And the problem is that most of these interest groups don't want fairness. They want somebody that they think they can count on about 99 and 44, 100% of the time to be on their side. And if you see an interest group going out and dumping a whole lot of money into a candidate, then you can pretty well conclude that that may not be that candidate's view, but that that interest group feels that person is going to be on their side 99 and 44, 100% of the time. And I think this desire uh, throughout the system for control, and they can say, oh, we just want fairness. We want to be treated fairly. But the reality is so many of these groups want control. And I think that we as a state and we as a people have got to look at the process and figure out what we can do to reform it because we are not going to wind up having a, a fair Supreme Court and one that can really occupy the place that it should in the respect of the people of West Virginia if this, this whole need to control elections and to control the court continues. Thank you. Mr. Ketchum. Well, there are so many pressing needs, Judge, that all three of us could talk all day. And I agree with Beth and I agree with Margaret on these pressing needs they spoke of. But I want to address one other pressing need, and that is the need for the study of intermediate courts of appeal. They're called courts of error. They're not constitutional courts, but intermediate courts of appeals look at the case to see if the judge erred with regard to the law or there was some miscarriage of justice with regard to a jury. And with as big as we are, as big as our state is, and the court only accepting, I hope we take more, but presently only accepting one out of every ten applications, people are not getting justice. A person in the northern panhandle, which includes this area, a person in the eastern panhandle, their divorce case, their boundary line dispute, their contract dispute, is as important to them as a $400 million verdict against a multinational corporation. And those people in these divorce cases, you said, well, that's not, if it, you wouldn't think it was bad if they, if, until they took your child unjustly. If somebody takes your child, you ought to have, be able to have a mandatory right of appeal for a judge to look at. And our legislature needs to adopt the Nevada plan to study if we can afford an appellate court, an intermediate appellate court for the eastern panhandle, the northern panhandle, and an intermediate court of appeals, as Margaret calls a specialized court in Charleston to handle comp cases. How much is justice worth? That costs about $853,000 a court. That's awful expensive. But not if it's your child that's been taken away. Not if you've been screwed by a judge. Not if a jury made a, a, a really bad decision in your case. Our citizens, des they deserve to have a mandatory right of appeal to see if there's error in their case. Thank you. We will proceed to our third question, and of course we're advancing in the uh, order of of uh, response, this will be addressed first to Justice Workman, then to Mr. Ketchum and Ms. Walker. Um, and I think maybe some of you may have <laughs> addressed this question a little bit already, but if you have anything to add, certainly we invite you to do it. There is a widespread perception in the media and elsewhere that the court system in West Virginia in general and the West Virginia Supreme Court specifically is broken. Do you agree with this perception? 
If so, how is it broken, and what should be done to address these problems? No, I do not agree that the court system is broken. You know, I think that overall we have a good court system in West Virginia. We have um, outstanding circuit court judges generally. We have excellent family court judges. I mean, there are exceptions here and there, but most all of them do a very effective job with the resources that they have. And um, I actually take up for the magistrates, even though those are folks who all they have to have is a high school education and they're elected in partisan elections. They actually process about 80% of the court business in West Virginia, and, and overall they do a pretty good job. So I do not think that the court system is broken. I think some of the issues that we've identified here this evening are uh, part of the perception, part of the reason that people have started to talk about the court system being broken, and I hate that term, judicial hellhole. I don't believe that West Virginia is a judicial hellhole. Um, but I do believe that we can do a lot to improve the perception of the court system. And it starts at the top with the state Supreme Court and some of the very issues we've talked about this evening and the changes that need to be made, I think uh, will accomplish that. And from there, I think that one of the things we need to recognize is that in West Virginia, the Supreme Court uh, is the administrative head of the entire court system except for the municipal courts. And overall, the system functions pretty efficiently and at a very low cost. The, the Supreme Court budget occupies a very small percentage, very small, of the state budget. And so I don't believe the court system is broken. I have to sort of stand up for all the judicial officers that I know around this state who do an excellent job every day. But obviously, we need improvements, and I think those have been identified in the earlier questions. Uh, no, I don't think it's broken. I think that we have hardworking magistrate judges, family law judges, and circuit judges. And they're, they're really hardworking. They're overwhelmed. When you get out of school, you'll see how overwhelmed they are. But there is a perception that it is broken. And it's because, starts with the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, it's because we're in the New York Times once a month. We're in the Los Angeles Times once a month with scandalous stories. Last, last month it said Supreme Court asked to fix broken West Virginia Supreme Court and then talked about all the turmoil that's happened in our court. It's a perception. And to change the perception, it has to start with the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. They're going to have to start act acting judicial. And that means this. We need a court like the United States Supreme Court, that divorces itself, each justice, from the social scene, that divorces itself and each justice from political speeches, that divorces themselves from going around seeking publicity. Our court, we need a court that insulates itself, sits up there and works, except for a couple weeks a year, and makes the state proud. And if we can get a court up there that acts judicial, our citizens will regain the respect for the court. But in, in conclusion, it's not broken. It's not broken because of our circuit, family, and magistrate judges. I think there is a perception when the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Los Angeles Times are always writing about our court and its scandal. First, I'll apologize. I forgot to turn this on when I spoke earlier. <laughs> and I did speak about this point uh, in response to what the greatest challenge is. But to add a little to that, I think we're talking, and, all, and I agree with a lot of what uh, both of the other candidates have said, I think we're talking about leadership here. I think we're talking about our justices acting like justices. You know, as I look ahead to the next 12 years, what I would like to happen, uh, if I am fortunate enough to be elected, is not to be in the newspaper. <laughs> Uh, not to have my picture appear in the New York Times and, and imputing some scandal again to our court. There is a serious perception. We have extremely hardworking circuit judges, magistrates, family court judges, circuit clerks around the state. Um, there are exceptions, and I don't think we should be afraid to address those exceptions. I don't think that the Supreme Court should shy away from trying to make the improvements uh, that are necessary, you know, in a respectful way, in a dignified way, and acting like justices. And not, uh, for example, sitting uh, in open court and addressing one of the lawyers uh, appearing in before it in a discrimination case as window dressing. 
I don't think that's appropriate. I'm frankly offended by it. And we need to expect just a little bit more in the conduct of our justices, not only in the way they conduct themselves in public, the way they conduct themselves in open court, uh, but also in the way that they do their job. Okay, thank you. All right, that completes our first uh, three uh, predetermined questions. Uh, as you came in, you were asked to complete um, a little slip of paper, I think, and write any questions that you might like to pose to our candidates. Uh, in order to get this finalized, so we were going to take a longer break, but we don't want to really take a break. Uh, so everybody just sort of hang in here for a couple or three minutes while we sort this out. We want to keep right on going with our uh, forum here this evening. So it will take a couple of minutes as we look at these questions, get them finalized in an order so that we can pose them to our candidates. in the restroom. She's going to use the restroom. I'll teach you. 
All right, if we can be seated, we can uh, continue with uh, questions from uh, our audience here this evening. We'll follow the same order uh, and continue to rotate um, for a reminder for our candidates and uh, for everyone. Uh, the first person to answer the first uh, question from the audience will be Mr. Ketchum, uh, followed by Ms. Walker and Justice Workman. So I will ask this first question to Mr. Ketchum. Why has the phrase legislating from the bench become such an issue, especially when it's the duty of a judge to interpret the rule of law? Well, I'm not so sure about this word interpret. I'm, I'm going to give you what I really feel. I think that legislating from the bench uh, refers to activist courts, refers to judges that think they know more about public policy than the legislature. We elect the legislature to set the public policy, not our court. And so an activist court, it, it's, I like, what I like to say is five old people sitting in robes up on a bench substituting their judgment for that of the legislature. That is activism, and we shouldn't do it. We really, really shouldn't do it. And uh, it's, it's got to the point where labor needs predictability in the law. Business needs predictability in the law. But if you got an activist court, they never know where the law's going, and you don't have predictability of the law. And we need that predictability. And that's, that's my view on activism and interpreting the law. Secondly, real quick, I've been practicing law 41 years. You interpret law when the law is ambiguous. I've seen very few ambiguous laws. The courts just say it's ambiguous so they can interpret it and apply their social law, their social views overriding the public policy of the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough to improve on that answer, actually, because I agree with you, Menace, uh, on that concept of uh, legislating from the bench. And just to give a quick example um, would be to watch the history of our deliberate intent uh, law in, in West Virginia, which started as a, uh, as a common law cause of action that was then turned into a legislative act. And, and ever since that time, and it's been more than 20 years, uh, the, the legislature and the Supreme Court has had a, a bit of a tug of war over exactly what it should be when, in <clears> fact, when, once the legislative, legislature acted, that is the public policy-making branch of our government. And it is that back and forth, well, okay, you know, the, the uh, elected senators and delegates make a decision, battle it out of the Capitol, enact a piece of legislation. It's signed by the governor. And then, and this is not unique to Mandelitis, um, everyone holds their breath to see what the Supreme Court does. Uh, everyone holds their breath to see if the Supreme Court overrules it or changes it uh, under the guise of interpretation. And that's what creates the lack of stability and predictability in our laws. Thank you. You know, I agree with the proposition that judges should exercise their own powers and not the powers of either of the other two branches of government, and that the legislative and the executive branches are the policy-making branches. 
And actually, I ran before, and I'm running this time on the theme that judges should restrain themselves to the exercise of their own powers. However, I disagree with the two prior answers in, uh, to this regard. I wish this world was you know, all made up of blacks and whites and clear-cut issues, but it's not. Um, I can tell you from my time on the Supreme Court, there are many, many issues that are ambiguous and need interpretation. You frequently have, uh, well, the deliberate intent statute's a good example. I sat on several cases where the legislature did have a law in place, and yet it was unclear. You could read it on its face all day long. I wrote one that actually uh, followed the law as it was on its face, and the very people who went in and, and lobbied for that particular law were unhappy with it because that's not really what they turned out later. They said they intended. But judges are not automatons. There are many times you have statutes that are inconsistent with one another. There are other times the statute is unclear, or there may be no statute, and yet a court has to give an answer. And so, you know, I think it would be naive to say that we're all automatons and we're just going to sit up there and every issue is clear cut. If that be the case, you wouldn't need judges with minds. You could have a computer. Um, and I want to conclude by saying, however, that, that by saying those things, I'm not, I've never been an activistic judge. Uh, my record is being straight down the middle, following the law and restraining myself to the powers that the Constitution affords to the judicial branch. But again, I think it's naive to think that there aren't many issues that have to be interpreted by the courts. Thank you. Our, uh, our next question is on the subject of recusal of Supreme Court justices. Uh, last year, we're all familiar with uh, a case that received a lot of press because of the decision of two justices to recuse themselves and one justice to continue to sit on the case. Um, given consideration to the fact that West Virginia is a small state, do you think that the current uh, standard or the current procedure for recusal is adequate? And if not, um, how should it be changed? How do we fix it? Uh, that is first proposed to Ms. Walker. Well, I have a difference of opinion on this, what I believe the position of the other two candidates, and that is that I don't think that the current system, uh, our judicial code of conduct, does need to be changed. I think that it creates clear rules um, about when it is appropriate for a justice to recuse themselves. Unfortunately, uh, in the heat of political campaigns, uh, in the heat of the politics of legislation and everything else, those rules tend to try to be used for political purposes. What I think the solution is, is to elect justices whose judgment we trust in the area of recusal. And my rule is, is really very simple. I will recuse myself if there is a case in which one of my family members is either a party or the lawyer. I will recuse myself from any case that was handled by Bowles Rice during the time I've been a partner. That's appropriate, and I will recuse myself from any case uh, in which Walker Machinery, my husband's family's company, is a party. There will be other kinds of matters where there's an issue in my mind. Maybe it's a friend. You know, there's, we're all related in West Virginia, uh, one way or the other. Uh, and, and that requires careful judgment. But if there is a relationship that I think might create some kind of an appearance of impropriety, I will disclose it to the parties, and I will give them an opportunity to express their concerns, and I'll take that seriously. I'll be conservative about it because I don't want to create these um, press uh, releases, clippings, whatever you want to say about uh, where, where we volley back and forth whether someone ought to recuse himself. I think we ought to put that uh, issue to bed. Okay, next would be Justice Workman. Well, I agree, uh, actually, that we have a clear rule and a good rule if it's followed. Uh, the problem we've seen in recent years, though, is that I don't think that, I think there's a perception and, and a strong feeling among many West Virginians that that rule has not been followed in several cases. And, you know, I made it my practice in the campaign. I haven't gone out and, and slammed anybody or, or said this person should have done this or that, because I think the people of West Virginia are pretty smart. They can look at the facts and, and, and see most of these issues clearly themselves on who should or shouldn't be recusing themselves on, I think, the specific uh, issues you referred to. The problem is, if that rule is not followed, if people aren't recusing themselves and disqualifying in situations where they either have uh, an actual conflict or an appearance of impropriety, you know, one of the things that I have suggested could be considered. You'd have some issues to look at to be sure that this wouldn't violate the separation of powers. 
but I have proposed that we uh, might want to consider a, a either a three-judge circuit court panel, and I hasten to add that would have to be chosen in the blind so that the identity of the judges and uh, their votes on the, uh, the review that they did of the refusal to recuse would not be known, and so they couldn't be handpicked. Uh, I'm not against a citizen member being on that panel either. But the problem we have is it's vital that the people of West Virginia, and especially the litigants, have a strong perception that they are being treated fairly and that justices are not sitting on their cases if there is either an actual conflict or an appearance of an impropriety. And if that doesn't happen under the current rule, then we have to look at making that change so people will have that sure perception. Thank you, Mr. Ketchum. Uh, I think we need an independent commission. Uh, which includes lay members of this permanent commission, and if a judge re refuses to recuse him or herself, that the commission looks at it and makes the decision. It's too much of a burden on a judge uh, when accusations have been made against that judge subconsciously to make that decision. But if a judge refuses, then I think there should be an independent commission. I might add, by the time this question gets to two of the three of us, it will be a moot question. Uh, the United States Supreme Court has before it now the case of Caperton versus Massey Cole, and this is the issue, the Caperton versus Massey Cole. And uh, I'll make an eerie educated guess, that's what judges say, an eerie educated guess that uh, the Supreme Court of Appeals of the United States will take in that case and they will send it back to West Virginia with guidelines for West Virginia and all 50 states as to how to handle this recusal issue. The United States Supreme Court is not going to let this go any further, and they will decide this issue in Caperton versus Massey Cole. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, our third question reads as follows. A recent editorial in the Charleston Daily Mail called for judicial election reform in West Virginia. Presently, West Virginia is one of only seven states that hold partisan elections. As a candidate, what is your opinion on the current state of the judicial elections? If you think our system needs reform, what ideas would you suggest to improve the system? And we are starting now with Justice Workman. Well, our system definitely needs reform. The problem is there are no easy answers to this, to this uh, particular question. You know, I personally don't really favor appointed judges because I think that anyone who believes that appointment of judges is not also fraught with politics is very naive. Uh, most of those uh, federal judges were not political virgins. That's not how they got there. And so, you know, appointed uh, judges are just as political, if not more so in some ways. And furthermore, every study that's been done shows that the people of West Virginia prefer to continue to elect their judges. I have over the years said that I would be in favor of at least examining the question of whether nonpartisan elections would help. I don't think it would help uh, a lot, but I think it would only to this extent. There would be a shorter election cycle and therefore somewhat of a reduced need to keep raising money, raising money, raising money. But that is the portion of the system that needs the most reform. Uh, something has got to be done about the fact that you have to have so much money to run for judicial office. Uh, we have to go out, and, and we, even though we're not allowed to ask anyone to give us a contribution, and that's a good rule, a rule I've always assiduously followed, we've got to somehow raise a lot of money to run for judicial office. And as I said earlier, the interest groups are getting more and more and more involved in wanting to control the outcome of elections, and I think it's, it really goes to the heart of the integrity of the system. And I don't know what the answer is. I've, I've said before that I think you should start with the candidates. I, I asked early on for every candidate in the race to come and meet, and let's agree on some reasonable spending limits, but I didn't get much response. Uh, I think it also, the public and the media needs to put more pressure on the candidates, and, and somehow we need to, and I've never really favored public financing of judicial elections, but I am, I would have to say during the course of this campaign, I'm moving more in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ketchum? Uh, yes, we have to make a change. We have to get the money out of the system. The present system on the people running for the Western Supreme Courts of Appeals 
is turning this into big time politicians that are walking down the street every day looking over our shoulder at these special interests. And why is that so? And why also is uh, nonpartisan elections not the issue? If we had nonpartisan elections, our primary this year would have been the election. And when you take our primary and take the Democrat candidates and third-party interests that reported and spent money in that primary, there was over $3.5 million spent in the primary election in this state for justice of the Supreme Court of the Peoples. Beth was lucky. She didn't have any opposition. But if it was a nonpartisan election, she would have been in with, it, in with us. And then it would have been over $4 million. I've only got a minute, so but I, I think the legislature has to study the Missouri plan, which is merit selection with an election component. Maybe there's some politics involved. There's politics in this law school, but it gets the money out of it. Or study not a public financing like North Carolina, a voluntary public financing system. I'd love to go on and talk about Judge, but he held up the sign. <laughs> well, then I'm going to let you continue to talk about it because, um, uh, oh, sorry, Ms. Walker. I'll let Dennis finish. Okay, go ahead. Well, I, this is the most important thing. It, it, it's, it's obscene. Qualified lawyers in this state can't run for the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia because they can't dig up a million dollars. It's all. The legislature needs to study first. The merit selection is called the Missouri Plan, where it's a merit selection plan where a qualified commission picks out qualified applicants and gives it to the legislature and the governor, and they appoint the judges. However, in three years, the public gets to vote on the judge that's appointed an up or down election and gets to vote on that judge every five years thereafter. You don't have politics, but the best judicial selection system in the world is our federal system. And how are they picked? They're appointed. But I'm saying put, a, put an election component in with us. Or study the North Carolina plan, voluntary public finance. And here's how it works. Man, if you would file your tax return and you owed $1,000 to the state of North Carolina, You've got two options. You can give that $1,000 to the state of North Carolina, or you can check off $3 and put it in a judicial campaign fund. Now, we're a smaller state than, than North Carolina. Maybe we would have to check off $6 or $7. I don't have all the answers. I do know one thing. The money has to come out of this system for qualified lawyers in this state do not have a chance to sit on this bench. Thank you. Ms. Walker. Ultimately, this is a constitutional issue. Uh, we are one of only seven states uh, who elect the Supreme Court justices in a partisan election. And I've continually said and urged the legislature to take a look at nonpartisan elections because under our Constitution, Supreme Court judges are elected in either a nonpartisan or partisan election, depending on the legislature's decision. So right now, without changing the Constitution, we could take, the legislature could take a look at nonpartisan elections, and I think that would be a worthy thing to look at, not just for the Supreme Court that, frankly, although this may involve a change in the Constitution, but also for our other judicial officers. Uh, frankly, it's been uh, my experience so far that being fair and impartial and having integrity are not qualities that are unique to either Democrats or Republicans. Uh, I think that a nonpartisan election might serve us better and, as Margaret pointed out, take away one whole election cycle, one whole campaign, uh, and which addresses the concerns about money. I am not in favor of uh, the campaign financing uh, that, that Menace suggests, and here's why. You know, he's suggesting that your taxes, you can just check it off and three or six dollars goes over into this campaign fund. Well, first of all, where, what are we going to do with that three or six dollars that would have otherwise gone into the state budget to fund DHHR, to fund other aspects of the court system, to fund, you know, any, any other part of our state's budget? We're talking about moving money, uh, and I'm not convinced that our state has sufficient resources that would warrant um, 
that would justify, I guess, putting that money over on judicial campaigns. And then what are we talking about? Are we talking about the Supreme Court candidates? Are we going to extend it then to the 66 or 67 circuit judges? What about the family court judges? What about the magistrates? I don't think our, our limited resources in West Virginia would be well spent uh, funding judicial elections. It also would create, in my mind, since Menace got to go over the time, do I get to as well? You do. And then we're going. <laughs> it also would create, in my mind, serious First Amendment concerns. You know, these elections are, are part of what makes us Americans and they, what makes us West Virginians. And yes, they're difficult. Um, but it, it is, it ultimately gives the voters the opportunity to choose, and I think that that's where we ought to go. I'm not totally against merit selection if it would be something that the legislature would study carefully, would vote on, would present to the voters of the state by way of constitutional amendment. Uh, I'm just not uh, convinced that that would be the solution because, as Margaret pointed out, I think it's still fraught with politics. Okay, I'm going to give uh, Justice Workman a minute or two here also to catch up. But perhaps all of you, or if you want to address this too, because I'm just uh, going to, uh, it's kind of a um, continuation of the same uh, question, is whether or not there should be any um, limit to the amount of money that a candidate can spend in a campaign, or should there be some restrictions or limitations on where money comes from. If you want to address those things, perhaps you can. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think the United States Supreme Court has said that you can't limit what an individual chooses to spend of their own funds. So, you know, with that said, in, you know, as long as you have very wealthy people who are willing to spend a lot of their own money, then, you know, you, you really can't really solve that problem. Um, you know, I think there potentially could be spending limits other than those which um, begin to... It seems to me, though, that if the individual can spend whatever he wants of his own money, that the limit shouldn't be put on the other candidates. I am very concerned. I know I've reiterated this all evening about these third-party groups, especially the ones that went to court recently. They went to federal court. You know, John Doe out here on the street, if he gives $50 to somebody, his name has to be reported. But we have all of these out-of-state organizations that want to come in and dump all kinds of money in the West Virginia election system for various candidates, and they don't want to reveal who they are. And uh, we have a statute in West Virginia that requires them to do so, but a federal court recently uh, ruled part of that statute unconstitutional. And so we see more and more of this insidious uh, outer groups wanting to step in control, spend large sums of money. And many of these groups are from outside the state of West Virginia. And again, the interest is control, control of the court system. It's, it's frightening to me as a citizen of West Virginia. And, um, you know, I, I really believe that uh, the state and federal levels, we need to examine and see what's happened to the election process that these kinds of things are being permitted to go on. Okay, what I'm going to do is give the other candidates one minute, because I think that will then pro probably make everybody about even. So. Mr. Ketchum, if you want to take another minute, and then Ms. Walker, another minute, if you want to. Judge, I think we beat it to death. Ms. Walker. I would simply state in response to your follow-up questions, right. is, should there be limits on uh, campaign contributions and spending? Um, there are limits. Um, there are significant limits on the campaign contributions that can be accepted. Corporate, corporate entities cannot contribute to political campaigns. Uh, individuals are limited uh, to a certain level of contribution under our state uh, election laws. And our legislature, um, kind of extraordinary in election year, actually changed the campaign finance laws in the middle of the election cycle this year in a special session. And that's the, the legislation that, that uh, Margaret was referencing that was recently challenged, uh, kind of an extraordinary thing. It is fairly well regulated. Right, thank you. I'm going to exercise maybe a moderator's um, prerogative or whatever and, and ask another question in the area of, of um, judicial elections. As you know, um, circuit courts are divided into divisions, and a person who desires to run for a circuit court seat has to choose the division they're going to run in, and Supreme Court seats are not divided into divisions or some other term that would be used. Do you think that should occur? Do you think the Supreme Court should be divided into specific um, seats and that a candidate should then have to choose which seat to run for? And we'll start with um, Mr. Ketchum. 
Why are you always starting with me, Joe? Because you know? that's the order. That's where we are. Uh, no, I don't think the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals race should be uh, divided into divisions. And let me give you an example why. If we were running in divisions this year, there would have been one vacant seat. That's Star Trek. And the other seat would have been Judge Maynard's. And it was at the time of the filing, and, and just as the filing period ended, that the pictures came out of Judge, Judge Maynard and Don Blankenship in Monaco. I'll guarantee you the other four of us would have run for that vacant seat. And having this full-blown scandal then would have been about an unopposed Supreme Court judge that would have been elected. Okay. That's a hard answer, but it's true. Appreciate it. Ms. Walk? I don't, uh, I agree with Nennis, but although maybe not for the reasons he stated, but I don't see what good would be served for the state of West Virginia to divide the Supreme Court into divisions as you, as you described. I don't believe that we should uh, change the law and divide it into divisions. It would be the incumbent, the Full Protection Act, and nobody who's an incumbent would probably ever get challenged. And, uh, you know, I really uh, I actually ran for circuit judge back when it was not that division. We ran in a group like we do for the Supreme Court, and uh, I, I do not want to see it be by division for the state Supreme Court. Okay. Next question. Two of you on this stage will be elected to the Supreme Court of Appeals. Uh, in the past, uh, Chief Justices, uh, or the Chief Justice at the time, has, has had an initiative to address a particular issue during, during his or her term. For instance, Justice Davis's initiative was the Year of the Child, while Chief Justice Maynard focused on technology in the courtroom. Would you have an initiative during your term as Chief Justice? And if so, what would that initiative be? We start with Ms. Walker. You mentioned Justice Maynard choosing technology in the courtroom, um, and that's been one issue I've been talking a lot about the campaign, and, but not necessarily in the courtroom, but with as far as the Supreme Court goes. We are behind in West Virginia in terms of electronic filing, in terms of uh, computer internet access to the filing. You know, the Supreme Court has a pretty good website, and it's a little uh, convoluted. It's a bit of a maze to find the briefs uh, filed in cases, but they're there. I think it should be something that's easy for the public to find, easy for students, easy for anyone who's involved in litigation, and not just at the Supreme Court level, but also at the circuit court level. I think that that would make our courts um, a lot more, although I hate to use this word because it's kind of a cliche, but transparent, more accessible, um, you know, just, just more up to date. The federal courts have had this in place in West Virginia uh, for some years. It would be uh, an expensive undertaking, but it would uh, protect our court documents and records from things like what happened in Morgan County uh, several years ago when the courthouse burned down. Uh, now, fortunately, in that circumstance, um, they were able to save the uh, court records. But, it, but that, that building burned very quickly, and we need to be good stewards of our court records. Uh, we need to be, make the courts more accessible uh, to the litigants, to the lawyers, uh, and, a, and I think it might save some expense ultimately in terms of the paper we're talking about because I think that's what they've seen at the federal level. So I would be looking at an initiative along that lines, probably at least early in the in, in my term. Well, I was the Chief Justice that started the practice of having initiatives. Before that, uh, that really wasn't done. And uh, I usually had two or three initiatives each year. And of course, I've talked about the Gender Fairness Task Force, the Broadwater Committee improving the court's response to children's issues. Uh, I established an initiative to reach out to the domestic violence advocacy community and, and uh, form a better communication with them so the court system could perform better when families were in trouble with domestic and family violence. Uh, we had the Commission on the Future of the Judiciary that went all over the state and studied ways to bring our court into the existing century. So, you know, yes, I would definitely have initiatives and probably they would continue to be in the realm of making the court system more effective in dealing with children and families in trouble. 
uh, Ted Filia, who was the court administrator of the entire state several years back, made the comment at once about my initiatives that, that I had taught him as the administrator that court administration was a lot more than counting the cases on the docket. Thank you. Mr. Ketchum? Uh, if I had an initiative, it would be improving the uh, legal aid system. Our uh, legal aid system to represent the poor in this state is in a shambles. It doesn't work. And you don't realize it. Everybody in this room is well off. But the poor people in this state get trod upon every day because lawyers won't talk to them. They just will not do it. And I see women come in my office with dragging two or three kids, and nobody will talk to them. And we have a legal aid system that's not sufficient to protect these people, and they need protecting. Or else let's just forget it all and have a free-for-all. But they are trod. It's, it's, I wish you guys could see it. The poor people were trod on because nobody, no lawyer, will take their call or listen to them. And we need to change it. I don't know how to do it. It might be, of course, more funding would help, but we probably can't do that. But maybe we can have some community service by all the lawyers. It used to, when I was a young lawyer, the lawyers volunteered their services in both legal aid and criminal defense. Lawyers don't volunteer anymore, and we need to change it. Thank you. Ms. I got one, bud. <laughs> <laughs> I already answered. You did? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I could think of another one. <laughs> We're done. One more question. Okay. So we have time for one more question, I'm told. Um, and this involves the current state of our um, appeals. It's been addressed a little bit by some of the in some of the prior answers. But, of course, the current appeal system in West Virginia offers no automatic right to appeal in any kind of a case no automatic right to have a case reviewed. Do you, do you believe this system is sufficient? If so, how would you change it and why? And we are now starting with Justice Workman. Uh, it would be a great thing if there was an automatic right to appeal, but I don't think the Supreme Court in our current structure could handle that level of workload uh, if every case in West Virginia that was you know, heard below was appealed and accepted for full review and a written opinion. Uh, I have said that I think that, number one, that all punitive damages cases should be accepted for appeal, and I say that because the U.S. Supreme Court has said that there should be a thorough and independent review of any punitive damages award. Uh, people often say, well, what about uh, you know, capital cases where someone's going to go to prison for all of their life? Should that not be automatically reviewed? When I was on the court, we had an internal procedure where even if that case wasn't formally accepted, it did have extensive internal review. And, uh, you know, we wanted to be sure that and we established that procedure so we would meet constitutional standards for the protection of people who were sentenced to a life in prison. Um, everybody's case is important to them. I'm not saying by, by saying that, there, you know, it would be impossible to have an automatic right of appeal that anyone's case uh, lacks importance. They're all important. But uh, I don't think that the current system could, uh, could process appeals for every single case that's decided to blow in the circuit courts of West Virginia. Okay. Um, next, get my order of things here is Mr. Ketchum. Uh, Judge, I talked about that in detail about the four, three intermediate courts of appeals I favor, and so may I waive that? Yep. Thank you. I think that we're talking about two issues when we talk about a mandatory right of appeal, a legislative issue and a, a, an issue for the Supreme Court. On the legislative side, again, we're talking about the Constitution, which currently gives the Supreme Court discretion to hear cases uh, if there is probably error on the record or when there is a, a proper matter for consideration, paraphrasing here, uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, of all the courts that, uh, of all the states that don't have an intermediate court, we are the only Supreme Court that does not have any mandatory uh, matter, or mandatory right of appeal. And if there is going to be a change to that, I, I think we're talking about a constitutional change, which is outside of what a Supreme Court justice could do. That being said, you know, there's been a lot discussed this year, in particular about the review of the punitive damages cases, and I think some careful attention needs to be paid to the U.S. Supreme Court cases that require uh, meaningful review of substantial awards of punitive damages. 
Uh, of course, our U.S. Supreme Court has not yet established uh, any kind of numerical ratios uh, for the award of punitive damages. Uh, that is still evolving. Uh, but I, I regretted to see, frankly, our Supreme Court not accept uh, the appeals of two of the seven largest verdicts in the country uh, last year. And I, and, I, and I would have to take a pretty careful look at those U.S. Supreme Court cases before I would have voted uh, to deny those appeals. So I, I guess that's one example. There are other areas, as Margaret mentioned, in terms of uh, criminal uh, capital appeals. Uh, but that's all discretionary, and I think there just needs to be a careful balancing uh, between the workload of the court and what the, the importance of the cases that need to be heard, the importance of the legal issues that are raised in these cases, unresolved issues, issues that have not yet been addressed. Thank you. All right, that completes our question portion of our forum this evening, and we will finish with our closing statements. The order for the closing statements will be reversed from the order of the opening statements uh, here this evening. So um, Beth Walker will, will go first, followed by Menes Ketchum and then uh, Justice Workman. So Ms. Walker. I guess I'll come uh, back over to the podium for the closing argument portion. Um, we've had an awfully great opportunity tonight to discuss a lot of different issues, so I'm just going to give a very brief statement here and talk about a couple of things. First, thank you again uh, for having this forum, for giving us an opportunity uh, to discuss these very important issues, some of which we've discussed a few times on the campaign trail, and we actually had a couple of new ones tonight, so that was good. But I want to take this opportunity five days before Election Day uh, with, I'm told, 85,000 ballots already cast in West Virginia uh, by way of early voting. I want to take, take the opportunity to thank uh, the other candidates, Menace and Margaret. In the course of the primary and the general election, um, I don't know how many of these we've done, <laughs> but it's been quite a few. And we've all basically been to virtually every one of these. We have, for the most part, been respectful. <laughs> and courteous to each other, and I appreciate that because I think that if you allow things to become um, uh, contentious, uh, insulting, then you really uh, undermine the dignity of the offices we are running for. Um, I, it's been very important to me in this campaign to run a dignified campaign, to try to focus on the issues and not the personalities or the politics. And I think what you've seen tonight, for the most part, is what I'd hoped you'd seen, and that is a substantive, you know, we have disagreements, uh, we have differences of opinion, uh, but I valued the opportunity to uh, discuss it with these two, uh, my fellow candidates. It, running, as I mentioned, for public office is a challenge, and it's something that I've enjoyed thoroughly now for 54 weeks. I announced my candidacy just a little over a year ago. And for the last three months, I've been running around the state almost continuously, and I haven't had the opportunity uh, to thank someone who has been um, probably uh, most important in the reason for my being able to do this, for, for my continuing on every day and my getting up. By the way, we started with a candidates forum in Beckley at 7 o'clock this morning. So if we're starting to fade a little, <laughs> uh, that, that's the reason for it. But I want to thank um, my husband and now 1L student, Mike Walker. I don't get to single him out very much because he's been up here uh, in class. So thank you, Mike. Uh, I think that the attention that's being paid to the Supreme Court race Although the reason for it may be controversial, I think the attention that is being paid is great. As I started at the, uh, out at the beginning, we're making a very important decision for the future of West Virginia. I think you've got, had a great opportunity to see the contrast among us, and I very simply and humbly ask you to consider this decision carefully if you're not one of the 85,000 who have voted already, and to cast one of your votes for Beth Walker. Thanks. You know, when I opened, I told you at the end, I'd tell you why I'm running. I think I've already told you five or four or five times in my answers why I'm running. So I just, I want to just say a few things to you. And my answers all really did speak to what I thought of the court and what ought to be judicial. And I really, really want to be what I call a throwback judge, a throwback judge. When I started practicing law when I was your age, 
the legal community was respected. And the lawyers talked to each other. And if they went to court or had a contract dispute in somebody's office, they vigorously defended their class position, but then they went to lunch. And now our profession, the most I can say for it, is we're the butt of 90% of the jokes told in this country. And it's got to change. And it's got to start with our Supreme Court. And our Supreme Court, by being in the paper all the time and fighting amongst each other, it's not good. The judges really do have to insulate themselves. And I want to give you one example quick, but I was proud of, I was proud to be here tonight. I was on the visiting committee up here when, uh, years ago. And I quit. I quit because I got tired of seeing students and grungy sweatshirts and t-shirts and flip-flops walking through these halls. This is an honorable profession. If you don't want it to be honorable, get the hell out now. We've got to change it. And it's got to start with you people. And let me give you an example. There's frivolous lawsuits. One frivolous lawsuit is too many. But we're having a lot of them. And you know why? Because when the circuit judges see them and they throw them out of court, our Supreme Court says, oh, that's okay. Let it go to the jury. But that's, we have rules to protect against frivolous lawsuits. We have rules to, to find lawyers and to punish them for frivolous lawsuits. But it's got to start with our Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court's got to let the circuit judges know that they're going to back them up. If they punish a lawyer, we've got to let them know we're going to back them up. And it's going to start with you guys. And it's just the way I feel. I was proud to be a lawyer, but everywhere I, I get so sick, all I hear is, is the lawyer jokes. And we've got, it starts with you and get started today. Thanks. Well, we've all been talking about ourselves and our ideas all evening. You've probably heard about enough, so I'll be very brief. You know, I think what I bring to the race, as I said earlier, is a record, a long record, of being fair, unblemished integrity, and a record of doing a lot of hard work. Uh, I also bring a record of being able to be very collegial with my uh, fellow justices, to work to build liaisons, and to communicate effectively and to and restore the level of integrity that the people expect and the, the, the perception that the court is fair and just and, and deciding matters according to the law. I'm very independent. I have never been the darling of business or labor, and I have never been the favorite of the plaintiff or the defense bar because I believe that judges have got to be neutral and fair. I think that we've got to also have compassion for people and yet the strength to make the tough decisions. And uh, I, I miss the work of the court. I feel that I could help calm the turmoil that's been in existence up there and help restore our, our state Supreme Court to the place that it should occupy in the respect of the people of West Virginia. And thank you all very much for all the attention that you've given to each of us tonight in explaining our ideas and our, our goals and our vision. Thank you. We get to keep these. Do you have any hey, Judge, do we get to keep these? Yes. Let's huh? see. That's de minimis in value, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, we're, we're ready to close. I want to uh, thank everyone who came out. I want to special thanks, as you know, to the Democratic Law Caucus and Republican Law Caucus and, of course, the College of Law for uh, offering their facility. Uh, thank all of you for attending. I'm sure in five days each of you will be in a voting booth at some point in time during that day. And this has been extremely uh, beneficial, in my opinion, to those present, those in this area, and the citizens of the state of West Virginia. We thank our candidates again. Remind you that there is a reception out in, out in the hallway uh, afterwards that you're invited uh, to attend. And let's have one more round of applause for our candidates. <laughs>